Hey, this is Pete Koch, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. Yeah, we're here. Uh, we're on Broad Street in Santa Monica, Broadway, and uh, uh, it's just awesome here. And it's always great to have you on. It's been a couple of years since we got to hang out together or doing the episodes, so it's good to check out. Uh, how I check you out? How are you doing? I'm doing okay. You know, life takes its uh, interesting turns, but it's always good to see you, Pete. I enjoy your show in uh, Santa Monica. This is kind of my hangout, so uh, it's good to meet here. Um, yeah got uh it's been kind of an up and down year for me uh, health wise and 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 career wise but uh you know uh, you know days like today that make everything uh that seem okay to me as far as i'm concerned i guess let's just start with the health things i know you had the hip transplant and a replacement yeah. and it and i know it didn't go exactly according to plan and you know look i'm in the age i've got bad hips my yeah. buddy tom had one done the same week you had one done He's still limping around, but he's he's okay. That hasn't gone the way that way for you though. Right. You know, it's so so it's interesting. I guess when I was uh, younger and playing in the NFL, I underwent a, like like most guys who play in the NFL, I had some injuries and some surgeries and that 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 kept me uh, kept me together. And then you know, f- fast forward thirty five years, and I'm sixty, so the orthopedic surgeries that I've had recently, and I'm looking forward to a couple more. Um, or just to um, to preserve what I've got now, and 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 I I think in, and as as a as a personal trainer and a strength coach, I I, I think people uh, I advise people to think in the terms of uh, as you're in your fifties and sixties, think about what you want to be doing when you're eighty five. Mm. It's 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 t- real tough to be doing uh, a lot of good physically once you get you know sort of towards 90 and i and i talk to my doctor friends about this stuff all the time but i'm 60 i'm thinking about what i want to be and how active i want to be in my 80s and to do that to do what i want to do which is and i'll tell you what i want to be doing i want to be lifting weights i want to be doing resistance training in all of its forms so that's lifting weights that's using machines that's body weight exercises push-ups pull-ups and I want to be doing all of that. And then I want to be, I want to at least be able to play at least one sport recreationally. In my case, golf is something I've played my whole life. But whether that is soccer or tennis or whatever, or it could be a softball league, there's certain sports that are obviously better as we, better for us as we age. And I want to be able to do that. So I've got that set in my mind. And I need my cardiovascular activity, my strength training. Uh, because I want to make sure I, I don't uh, run into any problems with lo- mu- you know, muscle wasting, sarcopenia, bone wasting, osteoporosis. That's no way to age. Uh, so we need to, to – to, and, and, and now I need to take care of the joints of my body. So I had my hip replaced, and I'm having uh, my, uh, my uh, rotator cuff shoulder surgery uh, in December, and I'm doing that not – you know, yeah, I'm doing it for today, but I'm I'm also doing it for uh, 25 years out. I'm trying to fix my camera here on the fly because this one's trying to autofocus. So I want to ask you another question. You're talking about like what you want to do in lifting weights. I just had one of my uh, one of my many doctors and nurses said, uh, "Hey, I want you to lift more weights," which is great for me. I like to lift weights, but um, I don't know if she knows like my full body condition. You know, where like swimming, I can right. do. I can go swim for an hour and a half, no problem. What are your thoughts on that? Like how hard when you've got damaged joints, right? And it, you're trying to manage it. I want to be able to walk around when I'm 80. I don't want to go out and start doing Romanian deadlifts and find out right. that I'm destroying my hamstrings or something, yeah, you know? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. And there's no doubt that there is an intersection with a lot of folks that they have some exposure or maybe no exposure to, to resistance training and then they get to, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about 50 years and older, where they start to hopefully understand that they, without resistance training, putting your muscles under mechanical tension in all of its forms, again, strength training, it could be the, using the machines. I see Arnold Schwarzenegger at my gym all the time, and I believe he's 75, and I can tell you that he looks fantastic for 75. It can also tell you that 
I've never seen him pick up a weight. What I do see him do is move around from machine to machine to a chest press machine to a back strengthening machine. Um, and he has clearly made a decision. And I've, 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 I know Arnold a little bit, but I've observed this for several years now. And he's absolutely made a, a decision that that's how he's going to proceed with his resistance training. And I, I certainly support it. He's the, you know, arguably the greatest bodybuilder of all time. He continues to look great at his age. And probably, and I'm not being critical of him, but the only, you know, one of the things I don't see him doing is really any stretching or mobility work. So I would add that to uh, if I were coaching someone, I do coach people, I'd like to see them embracing a comprehensive approach to their, their physical fitness. And the, the centerpiece of that being strength training because the other stuff is really not very meaningful if you if you if you no longer have any strength so the strength training and then the mobility work mobility work and stretching your muscles is uh they're they're similar but but just a little bit different too but the but the ability to move with grace in a fluid fashion that's that's the kind of stuff we're looking for can i replace um my weightlifting prescription with just swimming and maybe like yeah. adding like a higher intensity because i do a lot of like I, slow steady that's a that's a really good question and you know and i also look at the data about you know the preservation of skeletal muscle that's that's what's really important and i would say i don't think you can and i i uh but but you know swimming is <clears throat> is a uh it's its own creature it's, it's really the only form of exercise we do, uh, you know, in w without being on a, on a surface, right? Right. Uh, uh, on a hard surface. So we're in a different, in, uh, different environment. And the question is, so, so here's the key. What, here's what, what makes resistance training go. It's, it's mechanical tension. It's on, on our skeletal muscles. So think of it this way. I think it's useful all of us human beings have 206 bones, 646 skeletal muscles, roughly 180 joints. The muscles pull the bones around the joints. And all that is set into action by the central nervous system. That's your brain and your spinal cord sending a signal out to the muscles through the nerves. And in, when you place your muscles under mechanical tension, all of that is really put under a certain level of stress, which elicits a response, a hormonal response, a cascade response of all kinds of things that are that will allow for your, your muscles to improve, perhaps grow if done correctly, when, especially when you're younger. But once we get past age 40, we, get, we start to get into such a deficit, a hormonal deficit, where we don't we're losing the amount, men and women, of testosterone that we have. And testosterone is the key hormone for building muscles. So with less testosterone, less octane in the, in the, in the fuel, uh, even if we stay at and try to keep up with the, with the strength training, um, it's going to be very, very challenging to even maintain it. And you have no chance of maintaining skeletal muscle unless you're doing strength training. So would how would swimming fit in there? Is there enough mechanical tension placed under the muscles? I'm not sure, but the only that would be an interesting study. But what we can do in the meantime is find out how much muscle as a percentage of our body weight we're carrying around. And that would be a there's many different ways that we can um, find out what our, our body fat and the, the sort of the, the, the flip side of the coin of our body fat percentage would be our lean mass percentage. And there's many different devices that we can use. The most accurate probably would be a DEXA scan that's available to anybody. You don't need a prescription. It usually costs about 100 bucks at an imaging center. And it's a device that just simply scans your body with just a little bit of radiation. And it, it will give an exacting figure of how much muscle versus how much mm. adipose fat tissue. Right. And it even accounts for the weight of your bones, et cetera. And it also measures the density of your bones, which is very important, too. 
my doctor, I have an internal medicine doctor that I met when I played for the Los Angeles Raiders. And he has a DEXA scan in his office and he has all of his patients use it so we can get, if they're new, they can get a baseline mm. of how much muscle versus fat weight they're carrying and the location of that muscle in two broad categories. We've got visceral, uh, visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. The subcutaneous fat is stored um, sort of between the muscle layer and the skin layer and the visceral fat is stored within our internal organs. It's in and around our heart, intestines pancreas and that cancer that viscera right that visceral fat that's by far the most dangerous and you can through with a dexa scan you can get an accurate measurement of where you're carrying body fat and sometimes even thin people have an excess amount of fat stored in the viscera that visceral fat and and uh Doctor, my doctor, uh, Rob Heisinga, will put people on a specific uh, diet or or, or uh, exercise program because that visceral fat's putting them at a higher risk of various diseases, metabolic diseases. Certainly works against people and all sorts of, of cancers. So it's an it's a, it's a more modern and interesting measurement of, of one's uh, you know physical condition. Yeah, thanks for that advice, Duke. I'm trying to sort this out, right? And then the other thing about uh, sorting out like what I have to do to maintain my fitness level is um, like hands, right? And like this chicken wing or chicken drumstick here and keeping this thing healthy and fat. And, you know, you have to, it seems like as we get older, we've really got to focus on a lot. I don't know. I mean, it, this is a different thing, right? you know, and then like right. your hip flexors start to go away and right. all these different things that, I've never thought of before. Like I'm just going to do push press or, you know, just deadlifts or whatever it's going to be. And maybe those exercises will do it, but I guess I'll get your thoughts on like how do, especially for ladies, how do you keep your hands strong enough to take that jar, uh, lid off the jar manage? No, boy, you really, you really touched on an interesting and, and, and increasingly well-studied topic. And that's the relationship between grip strength and longevity. Mm. Believe it or not. I mean, it, it, it there, there seems to be a correlation correlation there and you know it sort of begs the question like oh should i be specifically as i'm aging middle age into old age should i be specifically training the muscles responsible for how strong my hands are those would be the you know the, in particular the the, the the you know the finger uh, 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 extensors and, and flexors in the forearm right it's basically the forearm mu muscles that mm -hmm give you grip strength and there's different ways to measure you know you've got the, the 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 most many doctor's offices can measure your grip strength with these uh these grip odometers i forgot the, the durometers i forgot the name of it but but also an interesting way to measure your grip strength that i recommend for the folks i work with that go to a gym is reg regardless of if you can do a uh a pull-up or not mm -hmm. get yourself up on a pull-up bar and hang and see how long you can hang for mm -hmm. and a a, a very uh, and, and men and women it's it's going to be about the same um no particular advantage or disadvantage that either way there and uh sort of a baseline of you know a sort of adequate at least a baseline adequate measure of grip strength is if you can hold yourself for one minute and there's people out there, very, very fit people who've worked that I know that have worked on their grip strength and that, that can uh, hang on a bar for three minutes. That's that's that would be probably elite. Uh, mm. But it's it's interesting. Right. So if you said there's a couple of, you know, confounding ways to look at how long you can grip and, and maintain your body weight on a pull up bar. And one is, well, shoot. I mean, obviously you're saying, well, how much muscular endurance do I have in my, my, in the flexors, the flexor muscles in my forearms and hands. Number two is how is this confounded by how much I weigh? Right. So if you're overweight, then it's, you're going to put an excess stress on your grip. Right. So, uh, and it, most people it, it's, and I said, one of the things that kind of reminds you for you, you folks that are overweight is, you won't be able to hang very long and and uh 
and you, so 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 correlating grip strength and how much you weigh becomes a, a little bit more interesting. I mean, there was a, a gentleman I worked with a few years back, and his goal, his stated goal, was to lose twenty pounds. Right there, twenty pounds. Okay, okay. So as it as it happens, I I have a a a workout vest, a weighted vest that you can load. Uh, it has a pockets that hold one pound increments of uh, one pound little sort of briquettes and it goes from zero to 30 pounds and I loaded it to 20 pounds and I said I didn't tell him how much it weighed and I said and at the beginning of the workout a strength and cardio workout I said just put this on just put this on strap it on and he put this 20 pound weighted vest on and we went through the workout and he goes man I've never been so tired you this making me do push-ups and all these things you made me, you know, skip rope and all these things you made me do with this vest really made me work so much harder. I said, that's the 20 pounds you're trying to lose. Right. Imagine how good you're going to feel without it. Yeah. And yeah. It just, just, just a little bit of an eye opening way to, to, you know, when you, when you get into those discussions about carrying that extra weight. I mean, you've said the best uh, on the show that, you know, the, the best day to work out or start working out was like 20 years ago. And also like uh hour a day, 28 days a month, you know, maybe you get a day or two off. Yeah. The rest of the time, if you want to invest in your longevity and your health, you have to do this. So when I'm swimming, if I'm just swimming, right. And when I swim, it's, it's uh, I won't say it's like walking pace, but it's about like walking pace, but I'm moving water. Right. And maybe I change my strokes and everything else, but I'm not, um, not, not working, but I'm also not, and by design, we're trying to take care of my shoulders. I'm doing that. Is that enough? Or does someone have to go out or like walk an hour a day or up hills, that kind of thing? What is what is the minimum if we're going to work out an hour a day? Yeah, you know, again, this, you know, you've got me uh, really thinking about, I because I don't work with, with I don't, I, truth be told, I don't really work with any swimmers. And I'm going to dig a little bit into the data that says, yeah. Um, one thing I know is that when people are trying to 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 change their morphology, which is to say they they just want to improve their physique, look better in a T-shirt. That means for mostly everybody, a little bit more muscle, a little bit less fat, or maybe even a lot less fat. And when they've all things being equal, when they I've seen studies where they they had people do their cardiovascular activity on land, for example, jogging, versus in the water that the the folks that were that were uh, land based were, were got a, a a a little bit more of a robust response to their cardiovascular system, mm -hmm. and it also had a better effect or more uh, positive effect on their skeleton. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't know that there's much. There must be some, but but part of of the uh, of the of again as big a problem as anything anybody may have, especially as they age is, is when their bones get brittle. So to stave off osteoporosis and, and we have to get our muscles under mechanical tension. Part of it is when is simply walking or mm -hmm. you know, so because we're dealing with gravity on that level. I know gravity plays a role in swimming, but it's, it's a different one, right? Right. When you're in a, you're in a horizontal position versus right. an upright position. So it's a good, good question. You, yeah. 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 Something to think about. And just I think you're using me as an analog here for this thing. Um, I use probably because of my body and trying to maintain so I can get in the pool every day. Um, I use flippers and I use a snorkel so that I'm not like twisting my neck all the time. And because that rotational stuff, it hems me up and gets me out of the pool. Right. And so uh, it's not cheating. I'm still moving the water but I'm able to use my hips in a way that allows them to be useful every day. And, and I'm not putting all the load on my shoulders. So I've, I've tried to balance it out, but I don't know that that's the right way. And maybe I need to do some laps with flippers, some laps, laps without, um, I could put extra resistance. Like you can have like a, as a paddle for your hand to yeah. create extra tension. The other thing I do is I just do uh, strokes that aren't strokes at all. Like I'll do, um, I'll swim in reverse. So my butt is going forward and I'm, I'm doing this way, right, to work my shoulders in a different way. And it's exhausting, you know, because all of my motion is that. And I'm also trying to, like, keep my body in this unnatural jellyfish-like position. 
Um, and it's all like, and it's hard to breathe out of that position. So I, I find other ways to stress my body, but again, I don't know. Like, and it's not a typical work. I don't want to do like, not wrong with it. I don't want to do Richard Simmons jazzercise in the pool. I want to swim, yeah. but, uh, but I also, I, I guess I, I need to like modify and, and, um, create intensity that probably isn't there. You know, that's interesting because the way that I tend to think about exercise generally is quantified in a, in, a, in a different way. And what I mean is that I like to have the folks that I work with engage from a cardiovascular, in, if we're looking at the bucket of cardiovascular exercise, right. I, I, see, I see two categories that are, that are quite different. And I like the folks I coach, including myself, to engage in both. So one is is the one we're most all familiar with, and that's steady state cardiovascular activity. And that's just, hey, I'm just going to get out and jog. I'm going right. to go jog for a mile, or I'm in better shape, and I'm going to I'm going to jog. For my brother, a 62 years old, three times a week, he goes out and he jogs four miles. Right. Shuts it down. Jogs four miles. Takes him. Uh, he runs about eight minute 830 mile or something right so 35 minutes shuts it down and then he does strength training two days a week which is great and i've talked to him a lot about that and that's that's a very very important part of what he does but um so go out and take a jog or go out and take a swim for 30 45 minutes whatever and and it could be on a bike and it doesn't even matter and it, you might go to the gym and use a step mill or or a fan bike you know yeah. one of those airdyne bikes and it, but the point is that it, your heart rate is steady, and you know I ask people to, and I can I help them calculate. Well, um, we we can uh, we we can the exercise scientists put cardiovascular activity into one, two, three, four levels, right? So level one, two, three, four, five. Right. So um, five being me and you are sitting here. We're at level. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, level level one. It means okay. you're, you're really not elevating. And if I said, "Let's me and you, we're going to sprint up this hill right. for a bag of money, and maximum, maximum, maximum that you can get your heart rate." And you can't do it in a pool, by the way, but you can do it. You know, running up a hill, you, you can do it on a bike. It's harder, but running is is a beast. So running up a hill and t maxing out your heart rate, where you just have to shut it down, is is level five. Okay. And but you can actually estimate these numbers by doing a using a mathematical formula. It's very simple. It's 220 minus your age, and then um, and then you fit into to these uh, level one, two, three, four, five by a percentage. Uh, level five would be 90 to 100 percent of your max. So mm -hmm. 220 minus my age, 60. 220 minus 60. My maximum heart rate. According to this formula, it's called a Corvonin formula, uh, would be 160. And for about 99% of the population, that math works. If you're 20 years old, 220 minus 20, your maximum heart rate is going to be 200. Right. And when we, me and you, when we were 20, it yeah. was 200. Right, right. And that's why when you watch, you know, the the NFL and the, and the average age of the guys out there is 25, and you realize their heart rate's going up to 190, 195 on every play. It's, yeah. It's wild. And then it recovers very, very quickly. That's a whole nother ball of wax. But I like to see people spending a certain amount of time exercising every week in um, in zone two which would be 60, I believe it's 60 to 70% of your one rep of your uh, maximum heart rate. Right. So it would be interesting. Do you ever wear a, a heart rate monitor while you're swimming? Sometimes, yeah. And do you know, know what you know where the numbers normally come out to? It's uh, It depends on what I'm doing, right? But um, it'll go from uh, like the high te the high 110s, you know, yeah. the 120. Uh, and then if I'm really pushing it, I get up to my, my VO2. Like right. if I do butterfly, like I've got, you know, not even 50 yards. And then I'm like, have to shut it down, have to go into recovery mode. Right. And so I'll do that. And that's, you know, that's me, you know, you know, butterflies, like I'm leaving the water every other stroke, you know? Right. And, and so it's, you know, a double, double, my, my hips are, are driving my thigh. It's a lot. And so it blows me out. 30, 45 seconds tops. So that's it. Perfect. This this perfectly sets up what uh, what uh, how I, I would coach you or you right. know, this would be 
uh, and you, you absolutely can do it in the water. Uh, but for mo- for most of the folks I work with, it's easier to, for them to accomplish this on a on a on a, on a bike or, yeah. or treadmill. But I would like p- folks to spend a certain amount of their time uh, in training in zone two. So do do the math formula based right. two twenty minus your age. Figure out a percentage. You just Google what's zone two. Right. And it'll it'll pop up. There'll be a calculator. It's very simple to determine. For example, I'll use myself as an example. Let's for me to keep my heart rate uh, roughly between 114 and 120, and and to keep that for at least 30 minutes, 60 minutes is even better. So I just want to keep it right there. At that level of exertion, you and I can have a conversation. I'm going to be breathing heavy though. You would be hearing my breath in this microphone. And and but it's and I'd be and I'd get a little sweat going. Me and you would get a little sweat going, but it's not something that's going to shut us down. And then I'd like to see a couple of times a week somebody engaging in some hard sprints, some high intensity training or hit training. You might have heard there's many ways to do it. And I'd like to see you get up to that level five, level four, level five, just for 10, 20 seconds and then shut it down for how long? Shut it down for a minute or two and just repeat it. People can get a massive amount of benefit from sprint training or hit training in just 10 minutes. So that might be in a swimming pool, a 20 second butterfly sprint, and then just get to the side, come to the side of the pool and let yourself recover for a minute and then sprint for 20 seconds, recover for a minute, do that five times. Yeah. You're done. Yeah, you're done. Yeah. And it's incredibly powerful. And it's training and benefiting your cardiovascular system and a cascade of, of hormonal responses in two very, very different ways. Again, one is steady state cardiovascular yeah. training. The other is high intensity training. That's great. Let's stop talking about working out. Let's, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's always so interesting because you have so much knowledge and you're able to apply it, you know, and, and again, like I've got this broken body and I'm trying to haul across my 50s, 60s, and 70s, so I can go do things still, right? But, like, I've got to rebuild an ankle probably, you know, but even that's like, oh, who does it? Do I do it? And then the other one need doing, and then, you know, it's just like there's so much stuff to manage. And, and again, you just went through this. Like, you rebuilt part of your body, and because there are more injuries there than you knew going in, I don't want to fill in the gaps here if I want you to tell us, but we're in this age where we have to do things like rebuild a shoulder or swap out of uh, part of the, the aortic heart you know, complex, you know, like yeah. there's cleaning out and there's cleaning our, you know, carotid arteries and everything. So when you go into this kind of thing, I don't know how much diligence did you do enough due diligence ahead of the hip surgery? Should you have had gotten a second or third opinion? Could anything have prevented the extra complications? I'm just talk in general about yeah. what you went through and, and then what you might have done differently. Yeah, I, I learned. I learned a lot. Uh, the, you know, unfortunately, the hard way. The hard way. So I went uh, five months ago for a total hip replacement. Just hip been worn out. I went, I, I got three opinions, mm-hmm. and and uh, I decided on a surgeon. I, I think, I, truth be told, I think I would have been comfortable with. I felt comfortable with all three, but right. one was just for a few logistical reasons. He was closer. It was the more convenient. Um, and he came with an excellent reputation, including operating and replacing the hips of personal friends of mine. But when I, I, but when I, when he, when I, uh, unfortunately, when I was sent home, I was sent home with new hip hardware, but also uh, an injury. I didn't know it at the time, but an injury to my thigh on mm. the same side. So at some point, I don't, I don't know exactly what happened, but at some point along the way of installing the hip hardware, there's two parts, there's a ball and Mm -hmm. a socket. Um, and there's some, you know, kind of carpentry going on there that, uh, some, some, some muscles and nerves were damaged in my thigh. So that was five months ago. And it's been a, uh, it's been a truth, truth be told, a a difficult recovery. I actually still seeing, uh, some doctors about best practices. It, it, it appears at this time that the so so I have I have numbness and a reduced function in my in my thigh, and uh, apparently the the good news is that the hip hardware that was installed works. It's just that I came home with a big injury to my thigh, to my muscles and my nerves, and I'm trying to figure out how to manage it. 
and it's, yeah. it's very challenging. Um, I'm actually seeing a, another surgeon today, later on today. So uh, frustrating that it happened to me. It's a, it's a surgery that has a very, very high success rate and patient satisfaction rate. Uh, it's actually considered one of the more simpler orthopedic surgeries, and I, I just, I just didn't get the uh, the outcome I was hoping for. Uh, I, th- I don't think I did anything wrong. Yeah, I think I, my, I think I had a very logical approach to choosing a surgeon in a hospital, but, uh, uh, and and and, and I, I think I just want to be clear. I, 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 I'm fully aware that doctors make mistakes. A mistake was made. No, what what was what 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 disturbed me was that I, the that the the mistake wasn't picked up by uh, the doctor later on. He examined me later on. His, mm-hmm. his physician's assistant examined me later on. I had a physical therapist working with me. He didn't pick up on it, and then I I left that community when I was still in a lot of pain, and I went back to my internal medicine doctor, my old friend from the Raiders days. And he and he a diagnosed or indicated to me that he thought that I had an injury and that I should go and have uh, advised me. To, and I went and got an, an MRI of my thigh, not my hip, my thigh, which which showed that I had significant. I had suffered a, uh, an injury to my I went into a hip replacement surgery with a healthy thigh and came out with a damaged mm. damaged one. So that sent me on a so I. It's, that got me away from my uh, original orthopedic surgeon and set me on a path to find the best practices to, because this is quite a, it's, it's, it's a rare occurrence, actually. Yeah. The, um, does your size, because you're an enormous person, right? And, and uh, I can imagine taking a hip off of a five foot two woman is going to require a little less, because it's physical surgery. I mean, if you ever see video of yeah. it, you're like, oh, my God, you know, like yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's almost barbaric to watch it, right? But these guys are pros. They know what they're doing. So. Is there any chance that that's part of it? Because it just takes you just take up so much space and require more force than someone who's small. Yeah, you, you know, you ask a good question because anybody who's listening to this conversation that is thinking about, and it's a lot of people out there that are you know thinking at some point sooner or later, a hip replacement surgery, and yeah. So here's two things that I think folks should know that there's a general generally two approaches to the where the to how the doctor is going to get the hardware into place and one is an anterior one's a posterior so just in medical jargon anterior is the front it's the front of the hip and the posterior is the back side of the hip almost like the top of your buttocks and um i think that i would recommend that everybody have a discussion with their surgeon whether they think that they should have that with the surgeon perform a posterior or anterior entry into the hip and why and just do your homework i mean there's so much information available on on the internet on youtube i've educated my i thought i had some education on on the surgery going in yeah and then i had to re-educate myself on the injury to my thigh Mm. which i uh um uh, like i said i'm still working with doctors to to rectify now now next up for me is i'm I uh, got a torn rotator cuff in my shoulder. So again, this is another common surgery amongst, uh, particularly amongst people older than fifty. Yeah, it's it's pretty rare. Young people have this. I mean, it would be take a catastrophic injury, generally speaking, to cause a torn rotator cuff when you're younger than fifty. But boy, they're they're quite common for folks in their in their fifties and sixties. And so here I am, you know, faced with this. And I, again, I've done my, my homework. And uh, there is a, an enormous variety of shoulder injuries. Um, a lot of times somebody's shoulder is hurt and they think they might have a torn rotator cuff. But it could be, it could be a bunch of different things. It's a very complex joint. And it's much more complex than the hip joint. The hip joint is a ball and socket. The, the shoulder joint, you know, it only bends in so many different directions. The shoulder is far more complex. And um, so I've been doing my homework, and I've, uh, and there's different types of rotator cuff repairs. Mm. So without, you know, getting 
down that that rabbit hole, uh, the, you know, I know the type of surgery that I need to to to, to uh, give myself the best opportunity to what that's to place myself now in a position so that I can do the things physically I want to be doing when I'm 85. Mm-hmm. Is, again, strength training and uh, and golf. Mm. And you can pick whatever you want. I suggest the centerpiece for whatever you do as you age is resistance training of re- resistance training of some type. And then and then fill in around that. Maybe it's maybe it's mountain biking, maybe it's swimming, maybe it's tennis. You fill in around that as you see fit. But but strength training. And so I at this point I cannot perform strength training um, due to the injury to my to my shoulder. So like what? How do I you know how do I go about fixing that? And well, in the solution unfortunately in, in, is surgery. But here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, your mic's an okay spot. Don't worry about it. I got you fixed up for that. So um, we are in this age, right? And so you have these long-term, like I got my hip fixed. I got to rehab that. Now I have this thigh injury. I still got the shoulder. Like it's, you know, for the next three years, you're going to be dealing with this, right? And it is, I know for me, a lot of my problem is like the PTSD, the anxiety, the depression, and it just stacks up. And I just, you know, I, I want to, and a lot of times I just give up and I'm like, ah, oh, just whatever, you know? And so there's that aspect too, but then there's also an appreciation for it. Like we get to do this. This is wonderful. I love talking to you and being here in Santa Monica. And so like, I have a greater appreciation for something as simple as this, but also my, my body and taking care of it, looking at 30 years ahead and seeing my, my girlfriend's parents and how badly they're doing, you know, and everything. It's like, oh my gosh, this is all, it's all sucks. So it's it's simultaneously the most wonderful time of my life. My life is so enriched, but it's also, I look ahead and I'm like, it's it's terrifying, you know? You know, you son of a gun. That's why I love talking with you. We've known each other quite some time now. We've, 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 we've gone down this, this, we've gone to uh, taking our conversation in this direction. Um, several times before yeah. and talking about how uh, in, in, in both of us suffer from, you know, intermittent uh, of anxiety and depression. And I, I, I will speak for myself and I'll say, I feel I'm very fortunate that I don't have that sort of acute depression where some people like say like, I just can't get out of bed today. Yeah. I've never felt like that, but this low grade buzzing, things aren't going my way. How do I get myself motivated to yeah. do things to improve my station in my life? And in and, and that, I've, I've battled that my, my, my whole life, you know, sort of have that coupled with anxiety. And then when you factor in uh, difficult circumstances and, you know, there's, there's no, there's no getting around the fact that, uh, um, shoot, this is going to be my, uh, ninth orthopedic surgery mm. and I, I certainly when i was a young athlete i i, I hadn't anticipated that it would would, would come to this I, I don't i think it just goes to show that i'm i mean I, I played in the nfl for six years and i don't know that it was because i was so remarkable but it's just that i had such a, a passion for it but you know four years of division one football plus the six years in the NFL is, um, you know, I, I guess I thought I might fall apart a little bit more gradually, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's hit me like a ton of bricks. So, uh, yeah. um, and, 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 and there's no doubt about, no doubt about it in my mind. And I, and I've done a lot of research on this and by the way, and I'll share this. One of my doctors said to me when I was talking about, and she's not even a surgeon, um, but one of my doctor friends, she's actually a dermatologist, but she's a wise woman and a, and a woman of medicine, of course. And, and, and I was telling her about I had problems with this hip surgery and now I've got this shoulder reconstruction. And it's it's really it's got me down at times. And mm-hmm. she said, I want you to know something that from a medical standpoint, that when you have an injury, you will become depressed. Nobody, nobody is immune to that. Nobody mm. gets off scot-free. And some may disguise it better than others, but that's perfectly normal. Yeah. There's no getting around it. So, okay, now, now, and, and when she told me that, the, 
the, the, the grace in what she said was just simply saying it and giving me permission to be down in the dumps about yeah. it. So God yeah. bless her. And I just want other folks to know that too. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, that's, again, like we're at this age where we can accept these things because, you know, you were a, a person who imposed their will on other people whose job was to impose their will upon you, you know? And so you're like, well, I can overcome anything because I can defeat these things. And I'm the same way. Like, I'm a combat guy. I'm going to go out and I, and I don't care if you're going to shoot at me. I'm going to do my damn job, you know, danger, whatever, right? And so we have these things. But as we've aged, that's not our business anymore, right? And so you have to figure out how to, like, pull different tools yeah. out of the tool bag and you're like, oh yeah look at this handy tool i have like i have grace i can use grace and if i uh you know if i text a friend and they don't respond back right away or if they respond back in a negative way i can be like i'm just going to give them a day or two a week a month whatever i'm going to come back to them with the same love i don't know that i would have done that when i was younger and i think this thing about we all hit this depression point we were going through this stuff with my uh, my girlfriend's family, and it's it's heavy. And I watch her suffer through it, and I watch her parents suffer through it. You know, like whatever their problems are, and that's nobody else's business. But these are hard problems. And when you're in that problem, you're that person who's 80, 80 plus years old, and you're not having the kind of quality of life. And everybody's aching, and no one's doing well. It's okay if I can't get out of bed for uh, for several days because I just can't like I just can't bear this weight. So I, I lay down and I deal with and. I work to get out of that mode, but I, I don't um, I don't beat myself up so much anymore. One of the things I've taught myself is like I don't have to put the bar at eight feet and jump over it every day. I take the bar off, put it right on the floor, and just I'm, I'm just going to walk over it. And when I'm ready, I'll put it at one foot, you know. But but we're wired because of who we were and our young, our youth to like I can jump over a mountain, and I'll be damned if you tell me I can't do it. I'm going to keep jumping, even if I'm jumping into the mountain. I'm just going to keep doing it, you know. I love that analogy. I'm going to use that. Please. About the bar. Yeah. I'm going to use that a, a lot. I mean, that was so visually powerful. <laughs> right. You described it and used it. I, I think it's so useful. Good. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be with <laughs> something. You've given us all so much stuff. And I, and I guess I should say this. You, you train people. Everybody should be like, I can be trained by the Swede. Yes, yes. I can <laughs> go online, to, go to Instagram, and, and it's at Pete Koch, and I'll put the link right here so you guys can see it. Uh, he's all over the place, and you do these fantastic videos about uh, motivation and, and just being a little bit better every day. And I, I love these things. And there's look, there's hundreds of them now at this point. Like, there's so many of them. You're always out there doing it. You're such an inspiration. And so yeah, I'm, I'm going to thank you for doing that for all of us out here in humanity. You know, we need that. Well, you know, thanks. I know you're referring to um, about five years ago. I thought that I wanted, I had something I could share on social media that, you know, we all have to make money. So for a living, I train people and I charge them money, but I thought I could also share some things. I, I At the time, I just had read a quote by Einstein. He said, aspire not to be a man of wealth, but rather a man of value. Mm. And I thought, I've got a head full of physical fitness, a lot of formal education, a lot of experience. Yeah. Uh, I, I had world-class strength coaches as an athlete and, 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 and world-class uh, athletes as friends and mentors. Even in my off-season, as an NFL player, my, my mentor was a world champion power lifter who had written 30 books on strength training, Dr. Fred Hatfield. And I was so blessed to have these people in my life. And, and then I've also, I'm also a very curious person by nature. And I was like, I can share people. So I, I created something called making you better 30 seconds at a time. And I just give her, I just give fitness tips. And over the years I've created more than 400 of these, these little snippets, mostly strength training, um, advice, but a little bit of food and a, maybe a little stretching in here and there. I've gotten a little bit away from that on my social media posting of late because I've been talking more about overcoming adversity when mm. going for an orthopedic surgery. And I'm kind of at a, 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 a fork in the road right now where I'm three weeks away from shoulder surgery, which is truly going to eliminate it, me you know, it's going to separate me from strength training a hundred percent for at least two months. Mm. So I'm, I'm having a, a, uh, 
almost beyond the rotator cuff repair, I'm having a, a surgery called a lower trapezius tendon transfer, a, a, a tendon from a cadaver uh, is going to be trans. My, my shoulder's so messed up that they can't use all the parts that are in it yeah. to fix it. So they're using an Achilles tendon from a, a cadaver and going to rebuild my shoulder. So wow. it's there's only a few surgeons in the nation that are even doing this surgery. And fortunately, one of them, uh, he's also the doctor for the uh, the Angels, the baseball team. And, and fortunately, he's here in L.A. and he thinks he can this give me the best chance of reclaiming the ability to do perform strength training, which is again my goal. Yeah. And uh, so I'm I'm thinking about using my social media. Well, you know, and I'm, I post on uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. I just post the same things, and to maybe act as a uh, uh, um, you know a guide to take people through the orthopedic surgery. In my case, it's going to be a shoulder, but other people are out there having ankle. Right, you might be looking yeah. at that yourself. You know, Dolph Lundgren has been posting about his ankle surgery. Right. You might want to go check him out. I do. On That's a great note. Yeah. So you got you got you got ankle the predictable you know problems that that people have. Uh, knee, I had knee surgery three years ago, and uh, shoulder. My my training partner had a, a, a very successful neck surgery uh, four years ago. She's a great success story. Andrea Andrea Logan Fitness is a great follow. And I just thought I might just take this opportunity to take people through the journey. I won't be able to see either, you know, I, I, because every time I post about an injury, it, it, it elicits, you know, it elicits a response from people that is, uh, it's, it's, it's almost tangible. It's because what, what are these surgeries and, and these injuries uh, having, what, what, you know, what do they have in common? It's pain depression yeah it's a stress and difficulty and i uh and a lot of folks like are looking for for you know you know what i think folks are looking for and i i relate is just somebody that they feel like there's somebody out there on their side yeah that that actually is feeling that yeah and and i think i think that's the role that i'm going to adapt in the next few months and um and it, again, it doesn't have to be specific to anybody after going through a shoulder surgery, but an injury of any of any kind. I mean, truth be told, one of my Instagram friends that went here, I never met him in person. Yeah. A gentleman who lived in West Virginia, and he was a professional, um, like a blacksmith, and he made oh, wow. custom knives. And like, he was such a cool guy. He actually sent me a knife, and like, we had this relationship, this kind of friendship. And then he's in his fifties, and then. He one day he posted that he had he had uh, cancer of the uh, of the uh, large intestine I mm. think it was mm. and it you know he never got better and then he and then he died ah. and fast and right. uh, and I was like um, so I, I like to make the the distinction I'm 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 going through a number of orthopedic medical issues mm -hmm. uh, medical issues they're all orthopedic versus i you know i think there's um, look I, I think it's useful to look at our health um and i and i speak to health from a, a fitness professional of course not a medical professional but i think it's useful to think in terms of orthopedic and metabolic and and all those other diseases from type 2 diabetes to cancer to uh, heart disease those are, that's what's going to kill you that's what's going to kill all of us right um unless you get hit by a truck that's how it's going to go down we're not going to die because our knee doesn't work that way right. Well. Yeah. right so i'm so blessed that i'm dealing with orthopedic surgery versus my friend who went through a number of yeah you know bowel surgeries and uh it, it, it was very very difficult Let's uh, let's brighten it up a little bit. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 a, no. I love that we're talking about this because it is it is an era of our life. Like I was just my buddy John, who was either going to send me or going to send you a video. You know, he, he we started the show together, and he was you know way too fat and and, and looking down the barrel of a lot of problems. You know, and uh, and a lot of us are like that, right? I, I'm like that. I've got to continue to work on this. And he found a trainer, and he's one of the. Um, it's one of the guys from Ohio, um, Barbell, the Barbell Gym guys, right? Yeah, and so he's in Concord, and he and he 
he trains champions. He's yeah. since um, the original guy passed away. He's probably the number one guy in the world for training champions, right? And yeah. so he walked up with John, and it, it clicked for John. And John went from being, you know, on his way to diabetes and everything else to being. I can wear medium shirts, you know, <laughs> and he's just so stoked. And he carries around the medicine ball and he's like, I used to have two of these on me at all time, you know? And so he's made this amazing comeback. So we're in this point in life where we can do it. Our odds are against a lot of us, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. Right. And so we have to go out and, and talk about these things and understand that, yeah, these struggles are out there and it's easy to look at like, yeah, I love the picture of you. Like you're in the middle of like throwing a probably 135 or something above your head. Like you're just like uh, probably more. I don't want to degrade what you're doing there, but that's like the best of Instagram, the best of us. You're looking like a million bucks. You're tan. You're in the sun. But then it's like, hey, by the way, I also got to get through these surgeries, and that's so not Instagram to be that open and to be that real. Like I have these, you know, I'll talk for me. I have these moments, long moments. Like I walk out. I think I had a day, one day with you, where I was just so depressed, but I was able to muddle through the day, you know, and we'd had a great time. We did shows. Might have been the day we did Bryce Fine, but I just felt like this blanket was on my back the whole day. And so we have to be able to talk about these things so we can all go, hey, we're in this together, and let's appreciate these kind of moments. Let's get together with our friends while they're alive. Because John and I were talking, and it's like in six months, we're going to lose. I'm, I'm 52. Well, I'm going to lose. I know a lot of people. I'm going to lose probably two people. And that weight is just going to go and go and go. Nothing we can do about that, but we can have fellowship. We can work out. We can get together and try to lean on each other. You know, that's the positive side. So I want to keep things positive. But if you have anything to say about that, I want to give you a chance because there's a lot in that. Yeah. What comes to my mind is that you're just reinforcing my instinct to, you know, jump on that that path where I'm going to I'm going to position myself. Um, where I can do do my, in my own humble way the best I can to support people that are going through any sort of uh, sickness uh, across the board, orthopedic, yeah. metabo metabolic, because you are right when you said that I'm going to be pretty much down because of the because I, I actually need both so shoulders repaired mm. and there's, I need to put three, four months in between. And because of the nature of this, uh, these surgeries, they're just, they're very time consuming. Yeah. Uh, there's no getting around it. There's yeah. no way to speed up the healing process. So um, with, sur with my first surgery, the middle of December, I've got 2023 blocked out from any strength training. Right. Um, I'm, I'm going to have a life. I'm going to try to make the most of that 2023. But I mean, and I don't mean... And so, for the first time in my adult yeah. life, I'm going to say, like, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm already, I'm already in my head, I'm trying to figure out every single type of different way I could do cardiovascular activity and lower body stretching and all right. those things. Um, but because I won't be able to do anything with my upper body for probably about 12 months. So, yeah. Um, yeah so, I, and I think I, I know there's going to be folks out there that could, you know, appreciate some support. Um, yeah. When I, when I put it out there, you know, it comes back to me uh, tenfold. I mean, the people that will take a moment or moments to to construct a note, an email to me yeah. that I don't know. I don't yeah. know these people. It just blows my mind. And uh, and but it but it just reminds me that just people paying attention. And most of all, um, and just something something happened during this last three years you know with, with covid that is uh it's changed the dynamic of the way people interact right and, and i think it cuts both ways right um but i think more so people are um a little bit more struggling a little bit more with being mm -hmm. down in the dumps and looking a little bit more to connect so i'd like to be part of that the uh the only thing i wanted to ask you about and it's one of the things i love about you look you act and you get great gigs all the time i love catching your you know like i don't i don't keep track so cool to track i'm like oh pete has a commercial coming out i love just to like bam have it drop in my lap and i'm like there he is you know it's so exciting but you also um at least at one point in your life you were a pretty fair musician do you, do you plan at all during this recovery time to maybe grab a trombone or something and, wow, that's and get the pumpkin so just a little history on that wow what a treat that's like a what a trivia question um yeah i was the um 
as well as being captain of the high school football team, I was the president of the senior high school band. Right. And I played the trombone. Right. So um, I haven't picked it up since high school. But, uh, you know, there's a story. You know, I worked with Benicio Del Toro for 12 years. Yeah. Now. I'm his personal trainer. Saw him this morning. And we just got, you know, one of our – we work out in two-hour blocks of time. So there's like yeah. a conversation. We – do cardio we do strength training stretching and a lot of conversation and and i i, I guess it came up because i said do, do you uh he's been in a couple of movies where he sings he uh -huh. says, oh, i can't sing but i you know he can he can, he can he can carry a tune he's and he's he's good i said you play uh do you ever play a, an in, a musical instrument he says no what about you and i said well you know i played the trombone said, get out of here yeah. i just can't no i said no no for reals I was even in the, the high school jazz band, you know, I was like, yeah, I could play, you know, uh, ask me anything about a trombone, you know I mean? Yeah. I mean there's seven positions, right? Yeah. In the slide. And, um, and he just loved it. And he goes, you know, I don't know how that might ever happen in your acting career, but he goes someday, somehow, somewhere there's going to, you're going to get a role and they're going to look, there'll be a, do you, you think you could get your chops back, like with your trombone? I go, I guess I could if I had a few weeks. Yeah. And he goes, so there'll be a moment where you could interject because the sight of you playing a trombone with your sort of physicality, yeah, and is would be such a wonderful gut punch, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the way he thinks in terms of, you know, as an, as an, a great actor and, and as an artist. And I thought, oh, that would be fun. Maybe that is something I need to revisit trombone. So I appreciate yeah. that. Well, uh, one of the guys we had on the show way back when, he's passed away now, but he's like uh, one of the, the, the most wonderful horn players ever. His name was Mick Gillette. He was in Tower of Power. He basically led their section, right? Yes, you know him. There's a video of this man playing, you know, elite level trumpet, putting it down mid song and grabbing a trombone and transitioning. What are your thoughts on that? It blows my mind. You know, first of all, if you, if, for those folks out there that do actually know how to read music, they will, they know that music is written in, 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 in both the, uh, in, in the, the treble clef and a bass clef. It's yeah. Just music jargon. It's like the notes look the same, but they're different. There's, it's like, it's like there's French and German and that the, the, tr the trombone and the, is played in, in the bass clef and the trumpet is played in music is totally different in the treble clef. So <laughs> these guys like him that not only go through the trouble of learning to, they're both brass instruments. Um, so they're pretty similar to get a sound out of them, but to, to read the music, you have to read German and French. Right. So it, that's a real artist. And in, in mid song, the embouchure, you know, is different. So there is like, and he's he's not sorting it out. He's doing it. Like there's no like, oh, I was half a note and moving. He's like nailing it. So it's great. Hey, do you want to ask? Do you want to ask me any questions? And I'll probably wrap up. We're basically at an hour right now. Oh no, I just uh, we talked earlier about your exercise and your yeah. health, and and I think that's something me and you should just stay in touch with yeah for sure to talk about and i and i you know and like one of the things i just mentioned and i'll uh i'm i'm glad to uh shoot i'm gonna give you a foam roller I'm okay give you a foam roller and, all right and and what we were talking about was sometimes muscles get very tight and massage is probably the the highest level of treatment that you could get to some chronically tight muscles and but this next best thing is to get yourself uh, a foam roller and to use it properly. You know, base foam roller, foam rollers got popular 25 years ago, and at first they were only used by physical therapists. And it was like, this is a piece of equipment. You need to be instructed on how to use it. Mm -hmm. Well, quickly they started showing up in gyms, and it, because they really work, and you don't need much instruction. And you can right. Google what's the best foam roller maneuver, right. you know, for my lats or my pectorals or my my trapezius and a whole bunch of videos come up and it's a tremendous piece of equipment so um it's inexpensive and it helps you to take care of yourself mm. in between your workouts that's awesome all right i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna wrap this thing up thanks for coming on the show i appreciate you let me uh roll the final credits here 
Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you so much for watching the Break It Down show. With it, because it just gets...